Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady. You do not want to miss this episode. That slow fire is about to spread like wildfire 2.0. Get ready, get ready, get ready. There are sons that are about to come into a full blazing fire in the new covenant, having their captivity turned. They know now that they have been restored to the Father. And that means all of the relationships best take notice. This is so necessary for us to hear and hear again. So share it with others. Thank you for being with me here on Tent Talk, the podcast of Nancy McCready Ministries. As we are here ministering in the nations of Europe right now, I pray for you wherever you are that you will hear him, that you will see him and yourself like never before. Here we go, my friends. Hey everybody, greetings from Ribnik, Poland. I'm here in my flat, so you might hear the fan going in the background, the dogs barking out uh, in the apartment, uh, you know, um, meeting area, which is, you know, where they have the yard outside, all of these massive apartment buildings that are all together. Uh, But can we press in for this moment? Uh, You know, restoration is something that is very dear to my heart. Uh, because I am the full beneficiary of the capacity of God and His church to be able to restore all things to God. I live a fully restored life. And it is so powerful when God brings you through that which the enemy and your own flesh in full cooperation with the enemy Uh, sought to destroy everything. And many times when there is restoration, especially in the ministry, the restoration focus seems to be, let's get those people right back in their rightful place of ministry. And uh, to be honest, uh, sometimes that's the reason why the marriage needs to be restored Really, so you can get right back in the ministry. Now, my friends, I'm going to submit to you, God is no more concerned uh, about our places of ministry, and dare I say, even our marriages, more than he is uh, fully focused on restoring a son to himself, be they male or female. God's number one purpose is to restore us to himself. And if then the two parties uh, want for his purposes to see the marriage restored to what he meant for it to be, and then if need be, how we live our life out with him, if that might be termed, ministry, then so be it. But my friends, once God restores you to himself, everything in life looks different. You are looking from a new vantage point. Everything about your relationship to him, to yourself, and to others shifts like holy shift. And when that happens, the entire way that you live in relationships, um, it is completely now out of the new way of life. If you want to call that new covenant, but I am also giving a warning today, be careful that the new covenant doesn't somehow just become a new set of beliefs, a new set of I am free and I don't have to do anything. Well, that is true. All has been done by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit so they could restore you to themselves. The entire point of the new covenant was there was an open slaughter of Jesus to put down everything that was old. 
so that in the Father reaching into death and bringing him out as the firstborn of an entirely new race and new breed of person so that they could now live in 100% compatibility with the Godhead. This is number one. Right? Ephesians 2, that by the cross they brought down all things of the old. They brought down the entire alien old way of living. So that they could create an entirely new kind of human being, giving every person a fresh start. These are the words Jesus spoke to Peter uh, when he was telling Peter about uh, how the Rooster would crow, he would deny him three times, and he said, Now, Peter, I'm going to be praying for you, and when you turn, you strengthen the brethren, giving every person a fresh start. Give a fresh start to all your companions. My friends, if you are only interested in getting restored so that you can get back to your charmed Christian life, back to your place of prominence and prestige. I don't care if you if that's before five people or 5,000. Do you understand? That's not the restoration that God speaks of. That's not what God's after. God, my friends, first comes for you. And when he captures you, for himself. Your captivity has been turned. This is what the scripture speaks of. This is what happened to Job. Uh, this is what it speaks of in Joel 3 1. We focus a lot on Joel 2 28, and I love that. You know, this is that. Joel 2 28, but right after that, Joel 3 1 says that your fortunes will be restored. And your captivities will be turned. My friends, God is flipping the house. He's flipping our lives. We will no longer be the center. The cross has come to realize for God what he always wanted, which was fully maturing sons. He wants a full bride for Jesus, a temple For Holy Spirit. Now, all of these terms, sons, bride, temple, speak of how deep the oneness is that they're after. They're about to turn the captivity of their people, of their sons, of the bride, of the household of God. And let me tell you, when they do it, no bribes, no pampering, and no spoiling is going to be necessary any longer. Because we're going to know what we've been delivered from and who we have been delivered to. So we're going to need to get this restoration in order, in God's order. And we are not going to be living in what I call a sanctified curse within our relationships. You can't scrub up the old and just Christianize marriage and keep Uh, fairy tales and gender roles and all of that in prominence because the curse my friends is where one lords over the other and then the other tries to usurp authority and I don't care how you Christianize that my friends it's the curse in the new when God raised us up everyone is now a priest We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation, men and women, co-heirs of the grace, able to walk in mutual submission one to another. Now, you're going to know the cross is at work when this happens. Mm. God is about to restore unto himself. This is why I can tell you plan A is still on. And nobody is going to be strutting around. There's not going to be women overtaking men, men overtaking women. We are going to have the the full sonship, the full corporate son coming together as God works privately in our lives, 
puts us in tune and in order to him, and then we will be fit to walk with each other, and the full house is going to come up out of that grave. And we are going to know how to walk together. We will be an open display, shoulder to shoulder, walking in oneness with him and with each other. And Philippians 1, 26 through 28 says that when this happens, it's going to be a sure sign of destruction to the enemy and a sure sign that we are now and actually saved, born again, restored to the Father by the life of the Son in the power of Holy Spirit. And my friends, I do not say this in hype and bravado, but then hell is going to have to back up. Just get up against the wall and stay in your assigned place of total defeat as the sons of light, the sons of the day, who are no longer playing around with darkness, will now hold hell back in the most powerful way so that God can keep open the door of salvation. And many will continue to come to him through his sons. My friends, come on now. This is going to find unique expression through many houses of fire. All over the United States, throughout Europe. Those are my jurisdictions, if I could say. As best I know right now. I think it's about to open but into other places, but we will see. So I want to read to you something that's for a maturing person. It's out of ultimate intention in the chapter, The Challenge is Made, under the subheading of Job Proves No Bribes Are Needed. Here we go. To the casual observer, poor Job was but a lamb led to the slaughter. Such is man's viewpoint. The enemy made it appear that it was not Job, but God who was on trial. Does a just and righteous God deliberately allow his own children to suffer? Job's life became a battleground on which the father demonstrated that he will win a vast family into love captivity without appealing to the hope of personal gain or the fear of loss. The one who has never spared himself would not spare Job but allowed him to go through tests which were to purify his motives. God depends upon none of the selfish motivations commonly used by men to gain a following. Instead, he, God, the Father, reveals himself to his children as wholly worthy of love and utmost confidence. Oh, that we could see that as a father, he is intimately with each of his sons in the time of adversity and through the hours of child training. What a revelation. Only the so great love of our Heavenly Father could subject a son to this extreme crucible of suffering. As human fathers, I would say as human parents, we know only too well how prone we are to spare those we love. Often in doing so, we really are only sparing ourselves. It would seem that only one of very special worth and value to God and his plan would be subjected to open display before all the eyes of eternity. Yet one who has taken his place with Christ in the heavenlies realizes that Job's case is not unique. The very nature and character of the Father requires that all his sons shall be tried. All must have their captivity turned ere they can fully know him as the Father. Oh, my friends, there is so much more in that chapter, but I don't want to hurt you. (laughs) Right? I don't go around loosely reading these things but i'm telling you when our captivity is turned when the house is flipped as his sons restored to him by the life of christ the mind of christ the nature of christ we will not be 
disoriented, clueless, confused sons any longer. But my friends, that's quite a process. And maybe I mentioned recently that slow fire is about to spread like wildfire. God is about to light up his house because he's about to light up his sons. And they are going to hear him, know him, because they've been restored to him. And yes, I certainly, as one who lives in such, I certainly hope that that will mean that true, grace-filled, new covenant marriages will burst on the scene where men and women mutually submit to one another. They know they are co-heirs. They know they first belong to the Father, not to each other. No one, no one trying to own another human being. No. But living in the covenant with the Father, cut in the very body of Jesus, written in his own blood for his own purposes, will get up and live unto the Father with the full permission of the other. Please go live fully unto the Father. Please, husband, please, wife, live unto the Father. And let us be an open display of Christ and his church. Hmm? And then that which we have called ministry will surely flow. Yes, it will. Hmm? His way for his purposes. So let all things, my friends, work together for the good of those who love God because they know that God loves them. Love is being put in right order. And they're called according to his purpose. And that Jesus, the first of many brethren, this is the image to which we are being formed and shaped in this hour. And oh, life is about to flow to nations. The light unto nations is about to come forth from God and his vast family of sons. And it will find manifold expression. My, 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 the many manifold wisdom and expression of God through the very souls within us. I might not know my Enneagram number, my friends, but I know this. My full personality is being formed and orbed by the life of Jesus Christ inside of me. And there is about to be a true breaking open, spirit to spirit, and then into the soul and quickening the body. For we are going to need every bit of his life, his mind, his emotions, his decisions, his life in our bodies being quickened for the great and magnificent works that lie ahead. Our captivity is being turned. And we don't come out the other side as pitiful victims of God's harshness. We come out as sons who are privileged to live in the power of his resurrection and fellowship with him in his sufferings and count it a privilege. Get ready, nations. Get ready. Our captivity is being turned and the holy nation inside every nation may she be invigorated and a royal priesthood will step forward knowing they are the peculiar people of God, meaning that in the spirit realm, a circle has been drawn around them and God has owned you as his very own. Oh yes, you can be seen in the spirit realm. We might be able to fool people in the natural, but in the spirit realm, we can be seen and known. And oh yes, we are. But now let it break forth into the natural realm so that others may know him and be fully restored to him. This is why Acts 3 tells us there is a repentance that brings a refreshing that there might be a full restoration of all things unto God, that every word he has spoken will be known as true. And may we, like it says in Acts 28, at the very, very end, 
This is in one of the commentaries. As Paul had a rented apartment for two years in Rome and spoke with people as they came in and out of his house about the kingdom of God, it described them that even though it was the last words of the book of Acts, it described those who would go on and on and on throughout the centuries and right here with us now that we would be an apostolic company of surrendered lovers to him. My friends, if we don't go captive to him in love, we will become captive to the things of darkness. Let it not be said of us. So I hope that this encourages you today. I love you all. I'm praying over you and the nations today. Until next time. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.com.